And so the one thing that could be said for, we'll, we'll come back now to the atom molecule level, where we have quantum mechanics on the one hand, and we have relativity theory on the other hand. And for those two to be internally self-consistent, and a sidebar is that science doesn't give you truth. All it can determine is internal self-consistency. Okay, that, that's all science can do. And for quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, the two of them, then the vacuum, the physical vacuum, is predicted to have a latent energy of 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, in practical terms, how do we grapple with that? All right, we can take, we can take a comparison of two things. We can take the volume of the known universe, that is like a sphere with a 15 million billion light year radius, and we can multiply it by the average mass density, which astronomers can give us a number for, and so we have, we have the right hand number. On the other hand, we can take a sim just a single hydrogen atom, which is mostly empty space, and say, okay, that's, that's, let's look at that amount of vacuum, and we'll multiply it by this 10 to the 94 grams per cubic centimeter, and we get a number. And that number is a trillion times this number. Now, the assumption in making this sum, the calculation, is you, you have to assume or we assume that the universe is fairly flat, okay? The curvature is, is very, very small. And that's what astrom astronomers tell us is the case. But it's not perfectly correct. So this isn't an absolutely accurate comparison, but it's a good comparison because it realizes that just that little bit of vacuum outweighs all the mass and all the planets and all the stars, and each of those grams of energy are e equals mc squared. So when you begin to really grasp this, you begin to grasp the enormity of the energy that would be involved in going down this rabbit hole. What is available for us to use in the future to take us to the stars, etc.? The issue is we are perturbing this with consciousness. We are able to, with directed consciousness and intention, we are changing things at the vacuum level, which then allow us to access a new level of physics. So we can do that at that level, not so much at the atom molecule level. That's a secondary effect. So, so you, we're already doing it, in essence. We're already getting into the rabbit hole by using intention. As you go down, you're going to successively higher gauge symmetry states. And as you do, the thermodynamic free energy per unit volume goes up and up and up and up <clears throat> until you get to the place of what caused the original Big Bang. So it seems like if there's that much energy in that small a space everywhere, it's, it, I mean, is it almost like um, <clears throat> we're sitting on, on top of a huge wave or, or it's more like there seems I mean, why, why doesn't the whole universe just explode then? Well, it's, it's potential energy, okay? It's not, it, <clears throat> it has to be unlocked. It's there, okay? It's just, just as if you have, mm, if you have an atom, okay? The, the fundamental particles are in a combined state and what their interaction and combining into a stable mode and emergent property, it is a potential well. I mean, the, the atom resides at the bottom of a potential well. Otherwise, it would explode apart. Well, it's the same sort of thing as you go down here. And if you take it as a metaphor that there is a kind of substance, that is, you can think, if you like, you can think of a cosmic atom, and the simplest part is what we know about the electrical aspect of that atom. The next part would be the interaction with the magnetic monopole aspect. And then the next part would be the aspects that relate to the emotion domain and then the mind domain. And so you, you build a more and more complex interacting thing which is, which is doing a divine dance. And so the stored energy is in this unit, all right? So, I mean, in essence, that's what you would have to unlock if you want to release and use that energy. Well, if you have your <clears throat> vib vibometer and that can measure uh, conditioned space. Yes. Is the next step to build a device that actually directly modifies that condition space? In other words, first they had thermometers, and then people figured if you light a fire, you raise the, the uh, <clears throat> temperature, which, of course, the thermometer right. 
So <clears throat> in your plans, do you see a uh, um, the equivalent of something where you can a device is built that you can change your symmetry states? Um, the first level for us is to build a standalone kind of device. At the moment, we have to take three streams of data and we have to work with the computer to convert them to the theoretical construct we've developed for this particular potential, which is called the magneto-electrochemical potential energy. And it's just an expansion of conventional thermodynamics. Um, and having that standalone, it'll be like a voltmeter in essence. Then, then anyone could just, you know, plug it into the wall uh, or whatever, and it would register and continuously register what's going on in the room. And that will be the first step. And the, f the second step will be you can use our work seems to suggest that you can enhance the capabilities of every bit of technology that we have in the world today by having that technology run in a conditioned space. Okay, because now you're accessing another level of physics. And, and that can augment. I mean, the intentions, just as we can change pH up or down by one full pH unit, and in living system, you go plus or minus a half a pH unit in either direction, you're dead on both ends. So these are very big effects. Uh, so, for example, in terms of, of healing, one of the things that we ultimately expect to do is to be able to broadcast this so that we create an environment where people are 500 or 1,000 miles away or 10,000 miles away, wherein they can use their intention to enhance their health. So, it's, so you can begin to see how you can influence various technologies. In a, let's say in a, a chemical plant or pharmaceutical plant, you, they want to make a particular product, and the product has isomers. That is, there are other things that are created at the same time, and the yield of the one they want is very low. Well, one uses intention to enhance the yield of the one they want and diminish the yields of the others that occur, so it's much easier to extract the one they want. A lot of savings. Uh, you can consider it in terms of, you know, in, in artificial intelligence. That has not been a big success because it doesn't have intelligence beyond what people put in the software. This stuff we're doing seems to have an innate intelligence in the sense that it, it not only lifts the gauge symmetry state of the space, but it tunes it to a specific intention. That, that requires intelligence. It just does that. It doesn't do all these other things. The ones that we, the devices we create for affecting fruit fly larvae, their ATP to ADP ratio, or uh, liver enzyme, or water, they're all different. One doesn't do the job of the other. So that's very interesting. And the, the really key interesting thing is, is that when these processes are used, and the gauge symmetry state of the space is raised, the thermodynamic free energy per unit volume of that state is raised. So for the very first time in human history, we see a process going on very different than the normal one, which is increase of entropy and degradation of potential. We see the reverse. We see increase of potential, which probably means reduction of entropy. 